Hi, my name is Steve Barrett, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of PR Week. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with Richard Edelman, who's uh, President and Chief Executive of Edelman Public Relations. Richard, welcome to PR Week, always a pleasure. Now we're talking to you today because uh, your firm is 60 years old, um, a great milestone, and uh, we want to ask you a little bit about the history of the firm, how the industry's changed, and your role within the firm. So. Your father, Dan, founded the agency back in the day. What, what, was, what was the sort of sparking point for, for kicking off Edelman PR? Well, Dan had uh, gone to Chicago as the PR director of the Tony Company in 1948, and there was an ad campaign involving uh, the Tony twins, and you couldn't tell which one had the salon uh, hair permanent and the uh, one from the box. And uh, he said, well, why don't I put the twins, Tony twins on tour? And he said six cents of twins out to 70 cities around the United States, and the media tour was born. And so he did that for uh, four years, and he thought, you know, maybe I could do this for uh, some other clients. And that's really the genesis of that one. Yeah, and that grew into uh, hundreds of million dollar business by the time you took took an active role in the agency it was kind of around the late 70s. Do you want to explain how, yeah. how you came into the business? Well, actually, the uh, agency was $6 million when I joined in 1978. Oh, wow. okay. um, and uh, we were operating in about six cities. And um, Just in the U.S.? Just No, we also had offices in uh, Germany and in London. We had mm -hmm. four offices in the U.S. and then two uh, X. Um, and uh, I was all set to go to work at Playtex as a uh, junior brand manager. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, that's a big sacrifice. But, but uh, it is. I went to uh, like a taste I, in a brewery. No? But uh, Dan um, uh, had an offer to be acquired by a DDB advertising, and he didn't really want to sell. And he said, you know, you've gone to Harvard Business School, and uh, so why don't you just work for me for a year? And so here I am, 34 years later, yeah. a little bit more gray. What was the biggest challenge then coming in, one, of coming into public relations, but also inheriting, you know, a firm with an iconic founder who also happens to be your father? Well, you know, going around Chicago when everybody calls you Dan, that's, that's a good start, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so I actually moved to New York about seven months into the job, um, ostensibly for a year. And again, I've lived now here 33 years. Um, and I think the 733 mile separation actually was good because I had a chance to develop myself and, and develop the uh, business in New York separate from the strong Chicago heritage that we had. And what about PR back then and, and, and how it's changed in the intervening time? Because you're now running a firm that's something like $600 million, isn't it? Yeah, it's 635, yeah. yeah. Mm. That's like what? That's a hundred times it's larger. 100 times and obviously, we've had inflation in that time, but it's yeah. a massive operation now. Yeah. Well, look. I think the biggest PR firms at that time were, uh, you know, person Marsteller, Hill and Nolan, about uh, thirty million dollars. So, you know, the business is just completely transformed. And what I see today is that you have a much bigger brief. You know, it used to be that PR, particularly on the marketing side, was oh, make the advertising work harder, like the Tony Twins example, or you know, take Morris the cat and make Morris a personality beyond the advertising for cat food. Okay, that was a period, but now actually in many cases um, the PR comes before the advertising. Also, in some cases, like uh, our recent campaign for Adobe on uh, Creative Suite uh, 8, um, the PR actually created the idea um, that uh, was the motive force for the marketing campaign. So is that genuinely happening? That's not just the industry talking itself up, it's genuinely happening, and the real budgets are coming to PR? I think that what you see is we were 2% of the budget, maybe now in some cases we're as much as 10 to 15% of the budget. I don't think we're still at the size of advertising, but that we can own the idea is, is a big change in, in the perception of PR. It's not right by default to advertising. I think we've talked about this before. If you look back maybe 10 years, you were about 185 million or something like that. You've now got up to 635. What's the aspiration? You know, we talked about is there a billion dollar agency out there in, in, you know, in the next few years? Ahead? What's your view on that at the moment? Well, I think completely it's possible that um, the uh, PR business could have a couple of firms in the billion range because if you look at the markets by, uh, by size, you see that the biggest firm in, in a place like uh, uh, you know, Brazil is, is $30 million, um, and it's a local firm. Um, so will the multinationals catch up? I believe so. Um, similarly in China. Uh, but also, PR is just at the beginning in the Middle East. 
Um, so you know, we have a six or eight million dollar business in the Middle East. Could it be twenty million dollars over the next five years? Yes, absolutely. Um, so you have to, it, it's really only at scale in the U.S. and in the U.K. But how do you make sure you get that consistency of service across all those territories? Global clients are demanding that global scale, but their frustration is that they get they don't, they don't always get the service they might expect in Europe or the U.S. in those other territories. Well, I think that you've got to be um, recognizing that it's a global and a local business. You've got to give your uh, local manager a lot of autonomy, uh, entrepreneurial opportunity. Um, I think also you can't force campaigns down their throat and say, like advertising, hey, here's the global creative, just go do it, and you're just an implementer. Also, you have to insist that um, they get a couple of local clients that theoretically can go out to the global network because that's really the game changer. You know, if you get a Mubadala in Abu Dhabi going outwards, then they have the hub business as well as the business that's referred in from the multinationals. And what about the whole issue of client conflict? Because unlike media and advertising where you can get massive amounts of money going through the system, which makes the agencies a lot bigger, but although they're, they're, chat, they're, they're processing money in many cases, if you get a billion dollar PR agency, you've got a lot of conflict there. Well, uh, we, we definitely see this happening at, at our size, and um, that's why we're really trying to uh, scale our, our sister firm, Xeno Group, um, and we're excited about that being in the 20 million plus range now uh, in revenue, and we're, we're really going to try and make that sort of the Golden Harris size uh, operation, because that's a real asset for um, the uh, enterprise. So that's your solution, is to almost grow your own mini Edelman network with uh, firms such as Xeno and even that crisp PR operation that you set up for the company. That's one of the strategies, Steve, but the other is to say we have PR, but digital and research are core parts of the Edelman offer. And if we can scale a research business, um, Edelman Berlin, to the same size as PSB, that would be great. Our digital business is already uh, about $90 million. And so um, on Volkswagen, for instance, in the US, we have the same size PR budget as we do digital. So that gives us a whole other way to proceed. And going back to Dan, what would you say the differences are in your respective styles in terms of running the business? Dan um, is a larger than life character and um, he was... You're not so uh, well, shy not, in that respect yourself. I understand, but <laughs> he um, was much more um, a sort of wagon wheel organization where you know everything had to sort of go through Rome in order to go anywhere. And I, I think I give a lot of autonomy to uh, the people who work directly for me. Um, and also, I think um, I look at public relations as um, something that uh, is corporate public affairs. He was very much a marketing person. I love marketing, but I also believe today it's brand and corporate reputation. <clears throat> and finally, um, I'm a bit obsessed about digital, as you know. And um, you know, in the same way that you know, he certainly understood the power of television. I think. In a way, I, I've, I've definitely understood the power of, of uh, digital. And he's been suffering some, from, some, from some ill health, which yeah. um, we wish him well and speedy recovery. How's he doing? And there's a book coming out, isn't there, in uh, December that sort of charts the rise of the PR industry? Yeah, so Dan's been in the hospital for the last few weeks. Um, he's stable. Um, he is a very tough guy. He's fought back uh, nicely, and uh, we hope to have him out of hospital by the time the book comes out in mid-December. Uh, the book is going to be... Uh, Edelman and the Rise of Public Relations, and it's by Franz Wisner, um, who is a well-known author, used to work at Edelman, and uh, we've been at this for damn close to a year. Um, the progression of the firm, the progression of the industry, and I think it's going to be an important contribution to academia, actually, um, and, and to all those young people in PR who are looking for a heritage that's uh, a, a really strong one, that they can say, oh, you know, this is a David Ogilvy kind of character um, mm -hmm. whom they could respect and, and, and really try to emulate. And despite his ill health, I understand he's still keeping tabs on the business. I have visited him every weekend <laughs> for the last six weekends, and um, as usual, um, as I go through the various offices and lines of business, and he's smiling or he's uh, grimacing, uh, depending <laughs> on uh, the results. And, asking me for, you know, why I'm doing certain things, which is the usual kind of discipline I've had. Keeping you in, in check. Yeah. Um, yes, for the last 34 years, <laughs> maybe 58 years since I'm older. Yeah. Now, you're obviously in no mood to retire yet, but there is the next generation of elements coming through. Is there an aspiration for that name to continue in the, in the, in the next generation through your daughters? Well, I have three daughters. Um, the expectation is that uh, the eldest, Margot, will come back from Harvard Business School and go into the business uh, next summer. 
um, and uh, maybe that uh, Tori, who's the number two one, uh, maybe go to work for us in China starting next uh, summer. And then the third one's off to college uh, this summer, and if so, next fall, and uh, I want to be an empty nester, so you and I have to have some more beers. <laughs> well, I look, look forward to that, but yeah, that's, uh, so another generation of Edelman's definitely steeped in the PR tradition and looking to carry on the, the tradition. Well, I think the big message is that uh, we're going to stay private and independent, and um, there's no uh, rule that says that an Edelman has to be the CEO. Um, an Edelman, the Edelman's will be the owners, um, but let's see them earn the uh, position first. All right, Richard, thank you for joining us. We wish Dan well in his recovery and very much look forward to the book launch in December. It's been great to catch up on 60 years of PR history. Thank you very much, Steve.